Thank you, Pastor Kay. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. Love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. Um, all those other things, <laughs> titles and stuff. I'm just a follower of Jesus, just saying yes when the Lord uh, calls. And that was uh, Beth Smith from your congregation, was a missionary in Brazil and visited our church when we were first pastor, uh, pastoring. And uh, we said yes, and we said a progressive yes. Whenever God asks, the answer is already yes. And so we never know where that's going to take us. We never know what the Holy Spirit is going to lead us to. It's just part of walking this life in the Spirit is you just, you just say yes. So we find out things sometimes uh, after they happen. And it's really fun in my role uh, to watch the Holy Spirit at work and then try to sometimes catch up with the Holy Spirit. Because when people are on the move, the church is on the move. And uh, there are more displaced people today than at any other time in the history of the world. Over 25 million displaced people currently. That will grow with the crisis in Ukraine. But when people start moving, the Holy Spirit takes that opportunity and carries the gospel with it. For instance, our newest work uh, around the world is in Sweden. You wouldn't think that Sweden would be a place that we're targeting. We didn't target it. I mean, that we didn't plan it. It's just one of these Holy Spirit things. What happened was refugees from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, been in, in uh, refugee camps for 15, 17 years, they finally get relocated by the United Nations to Sweden. They're free Methodist pastors. So what they do, they registered the Free Methodist Church with the government of Sweden. They didn't ask anybody. They didn't ask permission. They just, they just rent, registered the church. And so here we have a, a Congolese refugee church in Sweden. They don't look Swedish uh, at all. They are Swedes now, but they just don't look as a traditional Swedish. I was talking to our bishop in the Philippines about that, and he said, oh, this is great because there are several Filipinas who have married Swedish men who are located where that church is, and they would like to connect with them. So now we have the first Filipina Congolese church in Sweden. Uh, we can't organize that kind of stuff. And I'll just, just tell you, in Australia, uh, we have uh, missionaries who have come from China, uh, missionaries who have come from the Philippines, church planters who have come from the Middle East, and pastors who have come from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, all converging together in Australia. We couldn't orchestrate that kind of stuff. We couldn't have a planning meeting and say, oh, how could we have four cultures together in Australia and plant a multicultural free Methodist church? That stuff can't be planned. So the Holy Spirit is at work, some, uh, some fun and encouraging things. Uh, the church in Egypt now has grown over the past 15 years from 30,000 mem members to over 180,000 participants. Uh, we don't know how to do membership when the church is growing that fast. We just haven't figured out membership class. We don't know how to ordain clergy when things are moving that fast. It just, we're just following the lead of the Spirit. Now, just kind of a side note, with those 30,000, from 30,000 to 180,000, we didn't build any buildings, and we didn't pay any pastors. Can you imagine what that does to your church budget when you don't have any building costs or any staff costs? Uh, and so this is organic move of the Spirit. Same kind of thing is happening in Latin America, where during the pandemic, the last two years, we have planted over 700 churches. Um, those churches are like nine and ten people each. They meet in homes. It's organic. It happens. We look for a person of peace. It's a pretty simple process. We find a person of peace. We start a Bible study. We sing together. We pray together. And then they go out in the community to heal people. I mean, that's what Jesus does, right? I mean, they're just doing what Jesus does, you know. And so we're, uh, we're, just, we're just loving the flow of the Spirit. Well, uh, I know you didn't come this morning to hear a report on world missions. You came to hear the Word. But let me start with this reading. A wind is blowing across the face of the earth, more tumultuous than the mightiest hurricane, more powerful than the vortex of a swirling tornado. No living thing can stand before its assault. Kingdoms fall, excuses fail, hearts open. The gale sweeps 
forward. No locked door of opportunity stays shut. No obstacle of worldview slows it. it it's eddy swirl into the corridors of any closed mind. The wind is more life-giving than the sweetest breath. From Adam until now, its exhalation gives life to any person. Its gust dresses dry, bleached bones in spiritually living flesh. Its mighty rush rests flames of power upon followers of Jesus. This zephyr has launched the ships of every movement of God in history. Disciples of Jesus are sent out, riding the waves of its force beyond the rims of every horizon. Distant peoples kneel before its melodic sound as waves lap on the shores of their nation and currents of air swirl through their valleys. Believers are stirred from slumber into mighty awakening by this wind, first a faint draft, then a steady breeze, and finally a swirling typhoon of life. Revival comes again, spiritual reliving, continuing its eons long journey. This breath now sweeps across another generation of panting followers of Jesus. No man tames this tempest, no human controls this zephyr, no meteorologist forecast its direction. No nation is exempt from its blowing, no community devoid of its wafting. No movement arises apart from its power. No method bears fruit apart from its life-giving breath. No willpower forms apart from its infilling. Yet believers, multitudes of believers, church leaders, and theologians forget its power. Generational amnesia spreads among us. We forgot how the wind has blown in the past. Instead, we reason that the wind no longer blows today or we relegate reports of this power to brands of the Christian church that make us feel uncomfortable. But the gale has never stopped or slackened. It is rushing and swirling around you if you will open your eyes. This wind has a name. Numa, Spirit. That's from Steve Smith's book, Spirit Walk. It's how he opens the book. It grabbed my attention. I would recommend it to you. He's a Baptist, but it's good reading anyway. <laughs> I want to direct our attention to the word of the Lord as found in Matthew chapter 3, the first 12 verses. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Father in heaven, would you do it again? We know the wind is blowing. We cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. But we know that your spirit is at work. We pray today would you come and baptize us with the Holy Spirit in fire. Would you burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire and empower us to carry the good news to all people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John the Baptist was an amazing guy. His birth was miraculous. Uh, his, he was born to Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were 
and Elizabeth was well past the childbearing years. The angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah while he was taking his turn on duty at the temple, and he gave him the news that his wife Elizabeth was going to bear him a son, and that he was to give him the name John. And Zechariah's response was, uh, how can I be sure of this? I, I, I've I've tried a, a million times to catch the inflection in his voice. I, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering how, just exactly, uh, how, how can I be sure of this? Because I'm an old man. And, and, and my wife, well, she's, she's well along in years. Noticed he didn't call her an old woman. I mean, he, he gave her a compliment. But Gabriel's response was, I stand in the presence of God. And you're not going to be able to speak again until all my words are fulfilled. Well, Zachariah couldn't speak and Elizabeth got pregnant. I don't know if that's cause and effect. When Mary came to visit Jesus after she was, she was pregnant, uh, Mary went in to the home, and when Elizabeth heard her voice, she said, uh, the baby leapt within my womb. Uh, we had a really funny moment at our church at Christmas time when this story was being read, and uh, it was misread, and it said, when Elizabeth heard the voice, the baby leapt into her womb. I was sitting next to my youngest son, and we had one of those I'm laughing in church and I can't quit things happening where uh, I was so thankful we were all wearing face masks, and I could just kind of have a good laugh, but okay. So it, that's not how it happened. Uh, it, uh, the baby leapt within her womb uh, at the sound of Mary's voice. Well, John was born. Zachariah could speak. And we don't know a lot about John's upbringing, but we knew that uh, he grew and became strong in the spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. When he was grown, he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That was John's baptism, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That was how he prepared the way for the Lord. I mean, Zechariah, his father, prophesied about him, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. That was John's mission, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Let people know that their sins can be forgiven if they repent. Now, we know John was an amazing guy. He wasn't afraid uh, to confront King Herod. Uh, he wasn't afraid to confront the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And when Jesus asked the chief priest and the elders, hey, tell me, uh, where did John's baptism come from? Well, they were stuck because they couldn't say it was from heaven. If they said it was from heaven or from God, then Jesus is going to say, well, then why didn't you believe him? And they couldn't say it was from the earth, because all the people around them thought they were, he was a prophet. And so they said, well, we can't say. When you don't know, you just, I, I, we just can't say. But Jesus said this of John. He said, truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. When the creator of the universe says that you're the greatest person ever born. That's a significant compliment. John was an amazing guy. And here's what John says about Jesus. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor, burning up the chaff, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The greatest man to ever live says of Jesus, I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. But understand the comparison. 
He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, the disciples didn't miss this. There's a lot of things that the disciples didn't get and a lot of things they didn't get right away, but they didn't miss this. Some of John's, some of Jesus' disciples were John's disciples before they started following Jesus. And they, they carried all that information about John with them. They, were, they knew about John's beheading. They knew about John's ministry. They knew all of that that was going on. And yet after the resurrection of Jesus, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave this, this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus, even after his resurrection, is referring to John and exposing the difference between John's baptism and his baptism. John's baptism was a baptism with water for repentance. Jesus' baptism is with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Then on the day of Pentecost, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter preached a message, and at the end of that message, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. On another occasion, a little bit later on in Acts, Peter was invited to the house of Cornelius, a God-fearing man, but not even a converted Jew. And at the close of Peter's message, he said, all the prophets testify about Jesus that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins to his name. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of them being baptized with water. They got part B. Now we need to give them part A. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them a few days. And then Peter got in trouble for staying with the Gentiles. He went into a Gentile's home and then he stayed with them a few days. This was against the Jewish law and so there was this big meeting. What are we going to do with Peter? Peter, explain yourself. And he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he came on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift that he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in the way of God? Now, later on in the story of Acts, there's this Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. Interesting how this comes up over and over in the book of Acts. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately because he only knew the baptism of John. He needed to know of the baptism of Jesus. There was something inadequate about his teaching. Apollos went off to Corinth, and while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. When he f found some disciples, he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism. Here it is again. And Peter said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. 
On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. I mean, this baptism of Jesus seems to be pretty important to the disciples. They have carried this message through the book of Acts, and it's obvious that they understood the difference between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism. Under John's baptism, they received the forgiveness of sins through repentance. Under Jesus' Jesus' baptism, they receive power to communicate the gospel to the ends of the earth. I mean, this is, after all, what he had promised them. While he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you skip down a couple verses, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so I have a real simple question for you this morning, have you received the baptism of Jesus? The baptism of Jesus is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire? I've been ordained in the Free Methodist Church now a couple of years. Forty. Something like that. I I don't know. What year is it? I I was ordained in 85, so it's been a while. I've had the privilege of pastoring four churches and this incredible privilege of working at the denominational level and with a team of missionaries around the world and national leaders. I I probably get to go to more free Methodist churches than the average person, have more exposure. I have an observation. Most who claim to follow Jesus have been living primarily under the baptism of John. They have been living under a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, which is wonderful. We want to live in repentance. We want to live in the reality of the forgiveness of sins. But if Paul were here or Peter were here or Jesus were here he would say we need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire John describes this baptism he says his winnowing fork is in his hand he will clear his threshing floor gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's his winnowing fork, it's his hand, it's his threshing floor, and it's his wheat. So the first question about being baptized with the Holy Spirit is, are you his? And are you completely his? If there's a lack of power a lack of boldness, a lack of effectiveness in our lives might be because we're not His. might be because we're still ours. The passion for us to reach the world is not in the needs of the world, no matter how great those needs are, but it's in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you do not live in the constant baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will wear out. It is where your power rests. It is where your purity rests in the presence of Jesus. And then I I love this little line, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I like that. It's one of my favorite lines in Scripture. Because my experience in life is that I have accumulating chaff. I mean, I think I've just about dealt with everything. Then the Holy Spirit comes and says, what about this? I'm like, oh yeah. More burning, huh? More fire. Because when the Lord begins that purifying work, it is like your heart is on fire. 
Sometimes you just want to cry. You got to stop or I'm not going to make it. But, but the fire does not go out. It's an unquenchable fire. <laughs> once that fire starts burning, once the Holy Spirit starts working, you can count on it when something else comes up. The Holy Spirit's going to be there and he's going to deal with you. Wow. That's, that's, we Wesleyans call that prevenient grace. God is always working ahead of us. Now, it's not been my experience that the Holy Spirit comes and does all of the burning of the chaff at one time. I mean, if I had my preference, I'd take the lightning bolt. I'd take the Elijah Mount Carmel story. You know, just come, just hit me once and let's clean it all up. But I found that God prefers the crock pot over the microwave. He likes a slow burn. And I find this fire burning continually. When Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, John said, well, wait a minute. I need to be baptized by you, and, and, and you're coming to me. The greatest man that ever lived recognized he needed to be baptized by Jesus. He needed to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. How about you? Have you recognized that yet? I'm telling you, it's good. It, it is so good. Charles Wesley knew of his fiery presence of God, and he knew it to be the end of his struggle. He wrote these words. My God, I know I feel thee mine and will not quit my claim till all I have is lost in thine and all renewed I am. I hold thee with a trembling hand and will not let thee go till steadfastly by faith I stand and all thy goodness know. When shall I see the welcome hour that plants my God in me? Spirit of health and life and power and perfect liberty, Jesus thine all victorious love shed in my heart abroad. Then shall my feet no longer rove rooted and fixed in God love only can the conquest win the strength of sin subdue my own unconquerable sin and form my soul anew love can bow down the stubborn neck the stone to flesh convert soften and melt and pierce and break an adamantine heart. Oh, that in me the sacred fire might now begin to glow. Burn up the dross of base desire and make the mountains flow. Oh, that it now from heaven might fall and all my sins consume. Come, Holy Ghost, for thee I call. Spirit of burning, come. Refining fire, go through my heart. Illuminate my soul. Scatter thy life through every part and sanctify the whole. No longer then my heart shall mourn while purified by grace. I only for His glory burn and always see His face. My steadfast soul from falling free shall then no longer move, but Christ be all the world to me and all my heart be love. You want to know how you know if you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Because all your heart is love. When you're consumed by love. When you reach outside of yourself for what is comfortable. To be able to share the love of Jesus. Several years ago, my son Jonathan was in junior high. He's 29 years old now, so it's been a couple years. He was a baseball player, and we went down to the batting cage to get some practice. I was taking him in there, and outside of the batting cage, sitting on a bench, were two women who were far more affectionate than I was comfortable with them being in the presence of my junior high age sons, an age where you're explaining a lot of things that are going on in the world to your children, and I really didn't have that on my agenda to explain that that day. And so I was a little bit frustrated as we went into the batting cages. And luckily, he was a junior high boy. And he was all about baseball. And so his, his mind was on the bat. And so while I'm in the batting cages with him, I'm secretly praying, Lord, would you 
please let those two women move along while I'm in the batting cage here. And we came out, no, they're still there. I'm, I'm a little frustrated as a dad. And uh, get in the car, I'll never forget this. Back up, look in the rear view mirror. And there's the two women, affectionate. And the Holy Spirit said, Jerry, do you have any idea how much I love those two women? He had me. Spirit of burning, come. You got some more stuff to clean out of here. My heart is not all love yet. The late pastor, Dr. Adrian Rogers, told of a conversation with a Romanian pastor, Joseph Tan, who suffered during the communist reign in his country. Dr. Rogers asked Joseph of his impression of American Christianity. With some reluctance, Joseph shares his impressions. The key word in American Christianity is commitment. The word commitment did not come into great usage in the English language until about the 1960s. In Romania, we don't even have a word to translate the English word commitment. If you were to use it, commitment in your message tonight, I would not have a proper word to translate it with. When a new word comes into usage, it generally pushes an old word out. I began to study and found the old word that commitment replaced, Adrian. The old word that is no longer in vogue in America is the word surrender. Joseph, Dr. Rogers asked, what is the difference between commitment and surrender? He said, when you make a commitment, you're still in control. No matter how noble the thing you commit to, one can commit to pray, to study the Bible, to give money, to commit to automobile payments, a house payment, to lose weight. Whatever you choose to do, you commit to it. But surrender is different. If someone holds a gun and asks you to lift your hands in the air as a token of surrender, you don't tell that person what you're committed to. You simply surrender and do as you're told. He said, Americans love commitment because they're still in control. But the key word is surrender. We are to be slaves of the Lord Jesus. That too is from Steve Smith's book, Spirit Walk. I wonder if you're ready to surrender today and begin this life of being Baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's his barn. It's his winnowing fork. It's his hands. We have to surrender. Maybe your baptism was said in the name of Jesus, but it was really just a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the Holy Spirit's working on your heart today, saying, I want to baptize you with fire. There's a strange thing about the Holy Spirit. You don't get to tell him your terms. You don't get to tell him your gifts. You don't get to tell him how you're going to work. And so when I give this invitation, I don't know what the Holy Spirit's going to do. You know, Aslan's not a tame lion. And the Holy Spirit works however he wants to. Our response is to say, Holy Ghost, for thee I call. Spirit of burning, come. Father, we open ourselves to you this morning. We pray that prayer that Charles Wesley wrote. Spirit of burning, come. Refining fire, go through my heart. Let your love reign in me. Lord, I can't 
do it on my own. I'm not wired that way. But your Holy Spirit can rewire me. You can make me new. Lord, we seek your baptism today. Jesus, we, we thank you for the baptism of repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. But today we want to say, would you baptize us with the Holy Spirit? We pray in Jesus' name.